This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Welcome to Covered in Pet Hair, a boozy web show for pet lovers on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Isabel Alvarez Arada, and today I have the pleasure of having a drink and a chat with a very dear friend who calls herself a crazy rescue lady, and she's not wrong. I'll tell you all about her and introduce you as soon as we come back from these messages from our sponsors. Welcome back to Covered in Pet Hair. I'm your host, Isabel Alvarez Arada, and today I have the pleasure of having a drink with a pet parent, a professional dog trainer, a pet sitter, an entrepreneur, dog person, foster manager, process implementer, wine snob, cocktail connoisseur, coffee lover, a Virginia native, a beach lover, wife to Gerald, mom to Evie, dog ma to Pancho, Lacey, and Leo, cat ma to Simon and Kitten, Vice President of Nova Pets Alive, my former business partner and very dear friend, Beth Wary Acker. Welcome, Beth. Woo, woo, woo. I'm so happy to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Oh my gosh, how weird. (laughs) (laughs) How weird to be a guest on my show? Yeah, it's different. How different our lives are than a year ago. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Beth and I used to own a pet care business in Northern Virginia and thanks COVID, it no longer exists. And so we both took on different roles in the pet care industry. And that is what we're going to talk about today. But before we go any further, anybody playing our drinking game, every time you hear this word, please take a drink of whatever you're enjoying today, but make sure you're over 21 to drink, always drinking responsibly and never drinking and driving. Beth, what are you drinking today? I am drinking a spicy margarita. Ooh, ooh. And she's already started drinking it because I can tell the rim is already half consumed. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Beth gave me the heads up that she was having a margarita and I live in El Paso, Texas. So like I also wanted to have a margarita because I live here and always want to have a margarita and COVID has really cramped my style on experiencing all the margaritas that this city has yeah. to offer. Did you know that Juarez is... Uh, I guess the birthplace of the margarita, which is literally 10 minutes from my house. I had no idea. I I don't know a lot of margarita history. (laughs) (laughs) Neither do I. So that's all I can tell you about that. But apparently it happened at a restaurant in Juarez, which is right here. So I live in El Paso, Texas, which is also known as Sun City. And so I made a sunset margarita. Look at that. That's pretty. That's really pretty. Isn't that so nice? Do you drink so it up? It, do you mix it to drink it? No, I don't think so. I I was telling Beth before we started that I really wanted to like dig into this early on because I've had it made for a little bit. But because I have to show off these amazing colors, mm-hmm. I had to like wait to try it. So cheers, Beth, for being on the show. Woo! We have shared many a margarita and cocktail in the past, but today we're doing it virtually. So cheers to you Thanks. and to everything you're doing. Yes, thank you. Like that this is amazing, and the only reason it's amazing is because of the tahini rim. It makes like, it. Like I don't really care what else is in here, mm-hmm. and I probably could mix it. To be honest with you, like maybe a straw would have been good. <laughs> this, this is uh, cranberry juice at the bottom. It could be grenadine or cranberry juice. Um, or pomegranate juice, but that's what we had. We had cranberry juice and orange juice and lime and tequila and triple sec. And oh, nice. yours is a spicy margarita. So are you, did you have a uh, jalapeno in there? Yeah. So there's, um, I use like this, I'm lazy. So I use this <laughs> organic margarita mix from Target, which is actually really, really good. Not too sweet. Cause normally the mixes are like so sweet. So it's not too sweet. It's pretty much just the lemon and lime juice or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then I got the canned jalapenos and I just crack the canned and I just like let the juice go in there. And then you do the tahini. So it's not, I don't have the fresh jalapenos, which is really what you want. You don't want like soggy, nasty jalapenos in there. So I just use a little bit of the juice. That's brilliant though. Actually, that's like a semi-homemade cocktail. It's a good use of canned food. (laughs) So in a zombie apocalypse, we can still have margaritas. So I like to start this show with a game. And because I always knew you were going to be a guest on my show, I've been working on this game 
for a long time. Like I already knew what game we were going to play when we finally did this together. This is called whose fault is it? Because you're a dog trainer and you will know exactly whose fault these common dog behaviors are like whose fault they are. Right. Mm -hmm. Ready. All right. A dog eating diapers out of the trash. Whose fault is it? The, they have pet parents. <laughs> <laughs> Whomever left the diaper in yeah. accessible. <laughs> or the baby. I mean, I guess you could. <laughs> you know, if the, ba- if the baby's like painting with poo, it's definitely out of the pet parents control, right? Right, right, right. And mm-hmm. those who don't have children, that happens. It has not happened, knock on wood, at this house yet, but I'm sure it's happened to many people. All right, second one, dog counter surfing. Whose fault is it? Um, the pet parent, uh, if you left stuff on your, your counter to make it like a a virtual slot machine for them to play all the time, you kind of done the damage there. So kind of your fault. (laughs) I cannot disagree. Dog sniffing guests inappropriately. Whose fault is it? The dog's fault. I mean, it's what they know. It's how they talk to each other. Now, if they're if they know that they do that and it's bothersome to the person, then it's the pet parent's fault for allowing that situation to take place. There's leashes and gates, but you know, that's just dog communication. Dog begging at the table, whose fault is it? So that could be both. I would say both parts right there. I would say it's the pet parent's fault because theoretically, if they fed from there, if they've adopted a dog that had a history of doing it, that's kind of out of your control, right? But also the dog's fault because the dog could just smell a lot of goodness or see people eating and want to take part. So that's equal parts right there. Yeah. So we've never let our dogs eat from the table, but Titan still will sit there and beg. And then of course, later in life, when my kids did baby led weaning, of course that reinforced the begging, right? which is kind of hard to to change unless you're separating them completely. But yeah, I blame Titan. Yeah. Um, yeah. Dog yeah. marking, dog marking inside the house. Whose fault is it? Well, if it's marking, that is a really big doggy behavior. I see that a lot with dogs before they're neutered. So that's really dog fault. However, if that's true marking, if it's just peeing everywhere, I'd say pet parent fault. Cause we haven't potty trained very well. <laughs> Amen. Dog chewing on furniture. Whose fault is it? Pet parent because there are such wonderful things called crates when they're not attended. If you can't pay attention, there's things you can do to contain them. Um, I've had many a case where a dog has chewed something up and I've only ever said that was my fault. (laughs) Yep, exactly. That's, I've had the same experience. I remember we had just gotten a couch when Sox was a puppy and I laid in the couch, like on the couch watching TV and I watched her take a bite out of it. And I was like, ah, she's bored. She's a puppy. We haven't walked her. It's winter. We've been lazy. And this is what we get. So there's my fault. All right. Dog terrorizing another dog. Whose fault is it? Both, I would say. Um, if dogs are having like interpersonal issues, that's kind of between them. But if we can separate them or keep them like manage that interaction the best we can, the more dogs <laughs> practice things, the more reinforced the behavior is going to be. So we're letting that become more, more of a reliable behavior, that terrorizing. It's both. I mean, some dogs don't get along or some dogs are easy targets. <laughs> the easy target thing is always in- ignored, right? You know, like it's like some dogs just have that energy, right? They do. They do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That they just You notice they- that at the dog park too. They just walk in and they just see them and they're like, mm-hmm. Yeah. Dog barking at the mail person or delivery person. Whose fault is it? I think it's the mail and, per- mail and delivery person's <laughs> fault. And I only say this because they don't understand what they're there to do. Like, and it's hard as a pet parent to like do that because most delivery people are really scared of dogs for rightful reasons. So this is just an endless cycle that like nobody's at real fault for. But if you're looking at it, cause and effect, it's their fault. They're coming over to their house and like doing stuff outside, making some noise. Like, you know, absolutely for sure. 100% agree. Uh, how about the last one dog being panicked around strangers? I would say both in that, get my words, right. 
sometimes that's out of con- our like control and the pet parent does have like the ability to set them up for success of like not maybe meeting strangers if they're too uncomfortable or getting food when they meet strangers you know one of my dogs is kind of fearful So as a former in-home pet care professional, now you're working alongside a doggy daycare training dogs there. So what has your experience been? Like how is in-home pet care different than doggy daycare? Well, doggy daycare is a lot because it's a lot of dogs at the same time. Um, You know, in-home pet care, you go to a client's home, they're not there. You take their one or two dogs out, maybe. Um, You get to focus entirely on them. You put them back, you clean up. And then we're done, right? And then we move on. Um, I don't work in the room, so I'm not managing the play. So that's like a whole other story. But I would say it's a lot of moving parts. Um, it's a lot of thinking and working with other staff members. Like I'm careful to, when I'm pulling a dog out, I like peek in the room to make sure everything's cool and calm before I like, you know, if they're having like an intense moment where like everyone's super excited. I'm not trying to like knock, knock on the door and like get a dog to come out, stuff like that. Or like looking through doors to make sure I don't bust in when they're doing a meet and greet. Um, there's more, it's more like, you know, we're working in an office together. Um, but what's really nice is that generally the dogs are really good associations with being there. So the fearfulness or the worriedness that we could sometime experience with going to, into somebody's home, that concern of us being in their home, it's really not there. They kind of, everyone's fun. So, and they all are pretty, they have to pass behavioral evaluations. So they're all pretty social. So there's not a lot of concern of, you know, that we sometimes would have of, is this dog a little bit too worried about me? When do you, how long do you take them out? And are they like sad to like be removed from play? No, they love me. And it makes my ego feel so good whenever my face <laughs> pops up. Cause I have a radio and I'll radio them and be like, okay, can I get Chewy? And they'll be like, all right, you know, and I saw Chewy in the video that recently was po- posted oh. out there. Yeah. I so, saw, I saw Chewy. I know Chewy now. <laughs> he's the star of Dogtopia, to be honest. <laughs> um, he's so sweet. Um, but yeah, so I'll be like, can I get Chewy? And like, they'll see my face through the window. Cause there's like tons of windows you can look through and they'll all come to me. Or if I go in to help them, like maybe the dog gets a little head shy about like going through doors. All the dogs are just on top of me. If I'm in the front, they see me, they're always excited. And I actually have a bunch of videos recently after working with them where I go, okay, we're done. And I go open the door and I'm like, let's go. And they go and sit on the mat that we start our, our work on. Cause we work, oh. we start at the mat, they sit and they look at me and they're like, no, we're not leaving. We're going to do this, this chain again. We're going to work on this obstacle course again. So I usually have them out for about 30 or 40 minutes, depending on how head, what their head space is. Um, and some of that is just, we're just practicing and working. And then we do kind of a final run that I record. And then I, um, when I get home, I like record kind of like picture in picture, I narrate what's happening. And that way the pet parents can stay connected to what we're working on and they can see their dogs being awesome. What have you noticed about the pet parents? Like the pet parents that take their dogs to doggy daycare versus the pet parents that have people come to their house for dog walks. Hmm. So there's totally different there's totally different things that we would experience that would be like normal for us. Like, I mean, it's going to go a little, a little shady, um, but no, just like, like concerns that pet parents would have. Cause that's what we would be really concerned about because we want to make sure that the experience is really good for the pet parent in all, in both scenarios. Right. Right. So, um, respecting their space, like, um, you know, making sure everything looks better than we found it, all that stuff. And that's kind of the more interactions we had, or like a mystery of like, what happened during the walk today? Like, you know, we have to fill those blanks in doggy daycare is kind of different in that. I mean, they can watch on the camera so they can see everything that's happening, um, when they're playing, but they're like rough and tumble playing. So some, they get injuries, like they get scratches and bites and you know things not bad things but just like plate like puppy teeth are razor sharp right so you know they'll get like you know stuff or they'll lose a tooth or something and then I've, I've just seen the pet parents have been kind of like oh god what happened like while they're there like I saw he had like a scratch or like he had you know um but they're a little they're different in the same um they're just I um know. I feel like our clients at the wag pack which is our former company. Um, the majority were actually really easygoing. Um, by the time they booked with us, 
they were already convinced by our history and our quality. So they weren't really micromanaging us. There were some. There were some. When, and when they did it, they did it in big ways. <laughs> yes. The, yeah. the, the range was different. We had like people who trusted us with their like newborn babies. Like they would have given us yeah. any, they would have left all their jewels and money out and been like, there's no way, and as they should, because we right. had a lot of, you know, integrity. But and there's, I maybe, and maybe that's a thing with dog, like doggy daycares. Um, this one is particularly small because they're new. So it's really nice. Um, but they don't get to know their pet care provider as personally. So I don't think there's as much of a connection being made except with like the front desk people. Those are the people they really get to have like a face-to-face -face with. So I think maybe people can be more worried because they just haven't made that connection. They don't have that one person they know is like, you know, I, I guess there, you know, they can be yeah. a little bit more micromanaging in that way. Um, and I think, I think a lot of people don't understand dog behavior and dog to dog play. So right. like, there's that whole thing with the camera being on that people will sit there and stare. And it's really important, especially for dogs to get breaks. And that's huge in the Dogtopia, like teachings for their staff is to give them stimulation breaks so they don't get too hyped. But pet parents can't really understand that. All they see is their dog going into a crate and they go, why am I paying for my dog to go into a crate? And that's what they get. I hear they get a lot of feedback about. Um, not that, And they don't do it particularly, they don't overdo it. They're not like, you know, they just give them like 10 minute breaks here and there to calm down and get to a good place or take a break. And I, they don't get that, you know, once you explain it to them, they get it. But you know, that space and time before they get an explanation where they decide what's happening and then you kind of have to- And like, they get really amped up and really like reactive about- whatever story they've made up in their head. I mean, pet parents are like parents, like, we're, like, yeah. just like if I were to see my kid at daycare being like, you go take a nap now, I'd be like, why is no one taking yeah. a nap? So yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, I guess yeah. pet parents, um, I don't think it's unreasonable. No, but pet parents just need to know these things maybe ahead of time. And I feel like that's what you're saying about the camera. It's like, you really have to educate them beforehand. You have to hope that they read whatever education you gave them, right? Because you're not going to like go through this every single time that they drop off their pet. You want them to like know that that's going to, that's an option and all the other things that they're going to come home with some scratches and that it's okay. Um, I actually asked on my Facebook page before we did the show um, to like ask if people have had uh, experiences with doggy daycares and somebody said like oh my dog got sick could it have been from there like sure it could have been from there it could have been from your neighborhood I mean this I Absolutely. know this person this person's in um like Silver Spring Maryland area that's a pretty urban area so whether it was doggy daycare or the like neighborhood that that dog is walked in there's no way to know but no, there's they're not. Gonna, they're anytime that they're around other dogs they might get sick <laughs> absolutely and I think that's a really good thank you for bringing that up because there is like a whole group of people with puppies particularly that go like, I don't want my dog to get sick. So I'm not going to take them places. And that's like in dog training school, like it is a huge, like, let's teach people that's not worth it. Cause the under socialization that happens, um, is way worse than maybe getting kennel cough, which by the way, is like one round of doxycycline. Like it's not that right. Big of a deal. Kennel cough for a dog that does not have an immunosuppressed situation. Mm -hmm. It's really just like a cold. We get it. Our rescue dogs get it all the time. And it does, it does go rap, rap, like rapid fire. And I have heard in doggy daycares, they have like a bout of it that happens. Sometimes it's vaccine resistant, but that's the thing about dog, like doggy daycares like this, they require proof of vaccination. So right. the dogs, it's different than if you were to go to like your local dog park, no one's there checking to make sure that they have all their vaccinations or that, you know, educating them on anything. Um, and especially in the doggy daycare too, like they clean up everything right after they pooped and they sanitize it with all these sanitizers. It's not sitting there to be run in like dog parks or walking on the sidewalk to step and poop. And that's how dogs get parasites. Right. So I can't even imagine a pet parent comparing a doggy daycare to the dog park because they cannot be compared. I, I, I'm, I know you're, you're saying that because it happens. So I don't know. I've never worked in the doggy daycare, but doggy daycare is a controlled environment where you have insurance and, and training and, and controls and literal, like a literal space dedicated for this. A dog park is just like a wild card. You don't know who's going to be there. You don't know if it's been cleaned. You don't know the last time it was maintained. You don't know if there's going to be a live wire on the ground because nobody may have known that after the windy day the day before. Correct. Really different. 
correct. It is, it, it is rather infuriating to be honest <laughs> when I'm telling people like, and I'm a, I know there's a lot of, a lot of dog trainers that don't like doggy daycares. Um, there's a lot of cons that they bring up, you know, that are true. They can learn bad behaviors. They can be, and I know dogs have gotten hurt, you know, cause poor management. Um, and that's particularly why I like Dogtopias. They have very stringent rules. Like no phones in there. Nobody can have a phone. Their music plays through the speaker. You can radio and ask for like the different radio change. Like there's nothing you're doing, but managing and staring at the play and trying to be open to it. Um, but yeah, they, they will say like, well, I take my dog to the dog park. So it's the same thing. And I'm like, it is not the same thing because I have a dog who should not be going to the dog park, but there is absolutely nothing stopping me except for my common sense for bringing her to the dog park. I could take her and she would not do well there. <laughs> you would not want your dog playing with her. Um, she's deaf. She can't hear. She gets hype, like all this stuff and think bad things could happen. So at, at least with places like Dogtopia, they're doing a behavioral evaluations. And even when a dog doesn't, isn't a good fit, there's, it's always just like, oh man, like I really wanted them to work here. I'm so sorry. Like, it's not like it's a bad dog. You're just not a daycare dog. And I've, we've said that a lot about, you're just not a good candidate for in-home pet care. And I have said that a couple of times recently, this is not a candidate for doggy daycare and it's fine. That's okay. It's not a big yes. deal. It's just, yes. you know, everybody's different. Everybody's an individual. And, um, for us, in the uh, in the in-home pet care situation it was usually the pets that were really aggressive to us yeah. because they weren't socialized to humans and were really uncomfortable having us in their house so like yeah. how could we care for a dog that's like pacing like a caged animal at the zoo before we even walk in the door like no mm -hmm. i can't i can't help you with that dog so that's why they wouldn't be a good candidate and a, a dog that's doesn't know how to behave around other dogs would not be a good candidate for an, a doggy daycare. They would be a good candidate potentially but they might for a midday. For the exactly. They would be yes. a great candidate for a midday mm -hmm. dog walk so that they could still get socialization with one human, walk, get their exercise and, uh, you know, get that outlet that they can't get at doggy daycare. So I know that you just took your youngest, your puppy, Leo, to Dogtopia as a... Mm -hmm. As, as, a, as a guest, as a client of Doctopia, How did you prepare yeah, him? As a client, yeah. How did you prepare him? Uh, well, I made sure he was fully vaccinated, um, got all his records. Um, he is, he is, he's a COVID puppy. The fortunate thing about him is that I board dogs in my house. I do more normal boarding. I do board and train and I run my rescue and I do all the intake and I am the fallback. So if anybody can't foster, falls through, there with me. So he has had a never ending supply since he was a puppy of new dogs. And he has done great with almost every single one of them. So he has like impeccable dog and it's natural to him too. Like he just has good dog body language. He understands how to play. He understands how to walk away. I brought pepperoni with me. Like everybody that walked up to him, gave him food. Um, they knew ahead of time that he was nervous with new people. So everyone knew to ignore him and look away. And we just took it really slow. Um, but yeah, I mean, being your own advocate for your dog knowing what their struggles are and speaking up about it most dog places are going to be like oh thanks for telling me yeah absolutely well actually i have a covid baby uh mila yeah. mila looks at people like wow there's other ones like mm -hmm. wow like i had no idea because we've really other than my family coming to visit and like the odd time we see somebody in the neighborhood she's not been as socialized as Noah. And it's interesting because Noah right now is not being socialized at all. He's three and a half and should be at school with yeah. like other kids, but he can't. So, but we were so, we were young and, and fun when he was born. And so we took him everywhere and he was right. making friends with people since he was like three, four months old, making, you know, right. talking like being cooed at by strangers. And so like he, even though the past almost year he's been held hostage in our home like we all have we all, yeah. still so so social and mm -hmm. Mila's like new people like wow I mean Noah blows kisses to our contractors like he's like super social and Mila's like ah! so I mean, same thing for a, a puppy. socialization windows I mean Evie's actually like that naturally even though we've done the same thing that you did with Noah my toddler and she's incredibly shy and this has not helped. Um, she's more stressed now about new people than she ever was. So it's, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. And it is going to be interesting with all these dogs, you know, once they're, once we're out and about, um, I'm prepared to try to help <laughs> as much as I can. 
you're going to be so busy. So how did you prepare yourself as the pet parent to let your little boy go to doggy daycare? Oh my gosh. So funny because I go there twice a week and I train, I know all these people, I have seen them handle anything and everything. And I trust them. Like I have no concerns about their skill levels or whatever. Um, and I trust the facility. I mean, the, I could not be a more comfortable person with that location. However, I did stand there the entire time and watched him on the camera. And I kept apologizing to the front desk, like, I'm going to lurk here. Because the second he starts getting, you know, um, if, he, if he declines or if he has a hard time, I just want to pull him out and take him. Because I was flexible like that. Um, and I wouldn't encourage that because that's really not how they should operate. That was a favor they were doing for me that I could just stand there because I was, I was supposed to be working that day, but the person didn't show up. So I was kind of loitering. Um, so <laughs> I just, I just try to remind myself of if this was another dog, as I was watching it, what would I think? And I had to keep saying that to myself. And I saw nothing but a hat, like he took five minutes and he was normal daycare dog it was as if he'd been there before. He was so happy. He was meet greeting everybody. So he, once he got over that hump and I didn't, I couldn't leave. I just stood there in the lobby and I just watched, watched the camera. Um, and then finally I was like, I think I'm going to call it. And then I just took him and took him home and it was great. It was ending on a good note, which is important in dog training in people socializing. Like let's, let's leave before it turns worrisome to me. Cause I want to keep this a positive experience. Um, that's, but that's so true. Yeah. I stood in the lobby with another pet parent and we were talking and then I was like, oh yeah, I, I like work here actually. <laughs> She's like, oh, and I was like, I, and I trust these people. These people are amazing. But like, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard, but then you see them enjoy it and it's totally worth it. Um, the only experience I have taking Noah to school, school was, um, at the YMCA daycare, uh, when I was teaching yoga there in Miami and, uh, he did not do well. And it really like messed with my head. And then eventually, obviously the more you take them, the more relaxed they are. And he had like one lady that would just like carry him the whole time. <laughs> and so at least for like the one hour, because I was an employee there and she knew I needed to be gone. She just held him the whole time, but they do get used to it. And I think Part of it was also that, you know, I was kind of codependent with Noah at that time. <laughs> Chris was deployed and it was like just as hard for me to leave him mm -hmm. as it was for him to leave me. And so I like, obviously my energy was totally wrong leaving him. I imagine when I take Evie to school, which I was going to do, I was literally looking at places for her to go right when COVID started. So same. Noah was supposed to be in school last fall. Um, I imagine I'm going to have, I'm actually, she has a little girlfriend that I think I'm going to try to, wherever she goes, she's like best friends with her. I think I'm going to enroll, even if it's more expensive than I want to pay, at least for the beginning, I think I'm going to enroll her there and like coordinate their drop off so she can like learn the world with Penelope and then like slowly move her somewhere else. <laughs> oh my God. I need a like baby book or kids book called the world with Penelope. Penelope is the cutest baby you've ever seen. I'll have to send you a picture. She's adorable. She's like, <laughs> oh my God, I'd die. She's a cute kid. <laughs> I need a, I need a, I need, I literally need a, a kid's book, Beth, of Evie's friendship with Penelope called The World with Penelope, please. That actually made me teary a little bit. But <laughs> I know, like I'm, li I'm asking you, please. All right, I'll write is, it. Yes, you have okay. to write it and we're going to be your first purchase. All right, so we're going to be right back after these messages from our sponsors because I want to dig in more into your rescue work and why you call yourself the crazy rescue lady. We'll be right back after these messages. Welcome back to Covered in Pet Hair. I'm your host, Isabel alvarez Arada, and today I'm having a chat and a margarita with one of my closest friends. And she calls herself the crazy rescue lady or a crazy rescue lady uh, because she really is one. And she's basically taken her home and taken her life and dedicated it to Nova Pets Alive, which is a Northern Virginia, a nonprofit organization aimed at homing, finding homes for pets. So Beth, um, I want to play a game before we dig into your role at NPA, which is what you call it. Um, I want to play yay or nay. Okay. Okay. I'm going to ask you questions and you're going to say yay or nay. And you can go into an explanation. You can make a face. You can roll your eyes. Whatever it is, you can answer however you like. Are you ready to play? I'm ready. All right. Yay or nay. Getting a new pet while expecting a baby. Nay. She didn't waste any time there. And I 
have to agree. Absolutely. Nay, nay, nay. Getting a pet over the internet. Nay. Nay or nay. Nay. Well, I will caveat that everything we are operating over the internet right now, but when it comes to buying and shipping a dog through the internet, absolutely nay. Yeah. No. Rescuing, like looking on like petfinder.com and finding a rescue near you via the internet. Okay. I'm asking like what you explained, purchasing a pet and shipping a pet that you have not seen, that you have no idea where they come from over the internet is a nay, 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 nay. Choosing a pet based on a photo alone. <gasps> okay. <laughs> <laughs> did you do that? Is that why you're laughing? No, it's just, <laughs> the am- <laughs> I did not. Um, <laughs> the amount of people that adopt from us that tell us the moment I saw that photo, I just knew that was my dog. And it's just like, we always kind of go, it, sometimes it pays off because sometimes it's like hard to place dogs and we're like, oh good, I'm glad like, that was yay you know but then like there's some that's like like girl you don't know this dog at all or like you don't know this cat like she's cute sure but like you know something about the eyes and I'm like okay like I don't know so with Titan who I talk about all the time because he's the love of my life Titan was chosen by my ex and it was through a photo Mm -hmm. and it was because he was like a shepherd mix and he was gonna be like over 50 pounds and I genuinely did not care what dog I, I just wanted a dog I genuinely did not care so I left that on his plate to like choose and when he showed me the picture I nearly died because I was like that is the cutest dog I've ever seen in my life and he is the most amazing dog I've ever had in my life but yeah it all it took was that photo for my I, ex I get it I've seen people get really amped like over their connection they have over a photo <laughs> where I'm like you need to calm down <laughs> okay like, so that you don't actually know like this dog could be horrible <laughs> this dog could be a nightmare like a literal nightmare yeah. that you're like I love the picture okay well that takes me to the next one manifesting the perfect pet yay or nay nay well okay no I misunderstood your question yay if you put it out there they will find you so yes I, I went nay thinking like, uh, you will be perfect, I guess. In right, my head. right, right. The perfect pet for you, not a perfect pet. Like right. there is no exactly. such thing as a perfect pet. Correct. And if you try to make them a perfect pet, you will be disappointed. 100%. Hiring a dog trainer or dog walker or both before the dog even comes home. Yay or nay? Well, it's great to do your research. It's great to know what's out there. It's really hard for a dog trainer or a dog walker to be able to commit to providing care without having any idea what your animal is like at all. Um, If they're a good candidate for an own pet care, um, some trainers really specify in certain behaviors. Like I'm not great at um, separation anxiety. So if you got your dog, I mean, I'm, I'm good at mild, but severe separation anxiety is not my forte. And so if you got a dog and like, turns out severe separation anxiety, I'm not the trainer for you. So good to have options and know who's out there knows who's recommended, but, um, you know, don't put all your eggs in that basket. I love it. Adopting a senior pet. Yay or nay? Yay. Very much. Yay. How old is senior to you? Um, Dogs, I would say over seven, six or seven. Um, Cats, probably about the same, actually. Um, That's when they start becoming senior in the eyes of an adopter. Um, But really, a senior cat would be like 10, 11, 12, or anything like that. Because their life expectancy is like 18, so Mm -hmm. you're looking at still having eight good years with them. Yeah. Yeah. An adult cat, which like seven or eight, like to an adopter, really, they do really perceive it as like a senior. Um, But yeah, dogs in general, but you know, little dogs, they live much longer. So like, you know, a 10 year old Chihuahua isn't senior, but you know, whatever. They might bite you. Everybody, if you've not seen the after show that I do, um, I always ask the same questions and uh, (laughs) I always ask, what is your least favorite breed? And Chihuahua seems to be a popular one. So <laughs> Chihuahuas are, uh, and I'm in El Paso. The our, our minor league team is called the Chihuahuas. So um, Chihuahuas, it's funny that you should say that because they have a, a little bit of a mixed uh, reputation. They do. I'll say that. 
to be diplomatic. I'll say that. Mm -hmm. All right. Getting a pet on a whim because it just feels right. Yay or nay? Nay. (laughs) Nay. Although I did, I did do that with my recent dog, but I am like more than prepared and know what it's like to add an extra animal to my life. But. Yes. Okay. I should say that this is for the average pet parent or family. I am not talking about somebody who has worked full time in pet care for almost a decade. That's yeah. not what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you are an exception as I think I would be too. I'd be like, no, yeah. no. Yes. <laughs> well, you know what you're getting yourself into. Um, the people that do things more impulsively, which is why I like really don't miss adoption events with COVID, um, is where it's just more intentional, I guess. I love that. That is such a good point. All right. Final one. I know that this one's going to be a little bit of a back and forth because there's no real right answer. Board and train. Yay or nay. I do it. I I provide services. I'm actually... I'm in a, I'm in a weird place with that where I really love doing it, but I just can't figure out the right combination, like the secret recipe to passing it all on to a pet parent, especially during COVID. Like I provide like notes and videos, but like, I'm not sure if you send your dog to board and train to get them perfectly trained and you think they're going to come back perfectly trained, nay, because it is not going to, ha- like, you have to be the one to train your dog. You have to understand behavior and understand what you're reinforcing. I know people who operate board and trains where they go, they have to come back for refreshers. And that's just kind of like the endless cycle, right? Um, Cause they'll, the behaviors will stop being reinforced and then they'll fade away and then they have to go and redo it. And oftentimes they're using aversive methods to train them to get those fast results. If you send your dog to board and train to get a better assessment from a trainer of like their behavior and for a plan, which is what I kind of like to do, like send them to me, let me have them for a week. Let me kind of figure out what they need, what direction they need to go in, what you're seeing, what's actually happening. Um, If they can thrive in a different environment, you know, whatever. Um, Then yay. Like you just have to manage your expectations and make sure you're going to somebody who's not going to, uh, you know, inadvertently or not abuse your dog. For those that aren't familiar, board and train is where the trainer takes the dog away from your home for X number of days, weeks, and Mm -hmm. trains them without you being there. And I am not a dog trainer, but my opinion has always been that the pet parent and the family is like a crucial element to training. So for me, I would never send my dog to a board and train unless it was something like you said, where there was such a, a deep concern that I would want somebody else to have eyes on this person and somebody that I trusted fully and only used positive reinforcement based, um, techniques. Uh, but I would, it would have to be something that like maybe socks, my former dog, uh, my, my dog who passed away in June, maybe she would have been a good candidate so that we could see her outside of her relationship with me outside of her relationship with Titan and see her interact with other dogs to get a, 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 a big picture assessment of her behavior and her concerns and her triggers. But like Titan, I would never send Titan to a board and train because Titan, everything that we need to do with Titan, we can be done here at home safely with the help of a trainer giving us right. feedback maybe once a week or whatever. I had somebody that brought their dog to me that the, they said the dog was horrible on leash, just like pulling all over the place, like can't listen, like all this kind of stuff, which when I hear they won't listen, I go, well, you're not communicating well enough because most dogs, unless there's something crazy, they can listen if they're, if they were on the same page and they, they're great people, like wonderful pet parents. They brought him to me. And the more I worked with him, if I was, I realized that, and this is, this is the benefit of a trainer doing it because we learn, we understand how to see different parts and go something else is here like the bigger picture we don't have any narrative behind like any backstory we just like see it for what it is and I noticed when I had him in my paddocks which are fenced we he would I got him to a point where he was loose leash beautiful like so attentive with me um wonderful when I moved to walk I have a very long driveway when I moved to go to the driveway it all went out the window. And I even generalized, I, I, I went and worked on that behavior in the front of my house and we could do it in my front paddock. We could do it in my back paddock, but we can do it on that, you know, driveway. And they live in Annandale, which is like a suburban, you know, whatever. And they it's a busy suburb. It's busy not, suburb. it's not like a country suburb, like where you live. 
Right. And he likes other dogs. He's social. Um, and I just, the more, and I just started realizing I was like, he's incredibly vigilant right now. Like he's hyper vigilant. He's worried. He's on edge when he's not in a fenced in area. And I kind of wrote up a plan and I said, I think you need to take him to the vet. I think you might need to get him on some anxiety medication because I'm seeing a lot of anxiety behaviors. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's genetic, um, but that's why you can't connect with him on walks because he's hypervigilant. He's too worried. And that's when they go, oh, when he was a young dog, we were walking and a dog came out of nowhere and attacked him. Oh, okay. Okay. Problem solved. Mystery and solved. He- Yeah. And I was like, that makes sense because when he knows there's a barrier around him, he can relax because his back's covered. When he's exposed, he has to always be looking and he's like whining, like he's nervous. Um, And they've tried, they tried everything. They tried prong collars, you know, which they didn't like. They tried like everything they could and they could not figure out what it was. He'd be pulling, he'd be erratic, but that was why. And I was like, okay, well we have a trauma then. So, and I said, is he like that when he walks by that dog's house? And they were like, actually, yeah. And I was like, you know, that's where it really amps up. So it's, it's useful in that. Cause I was able to see something is wrong in this area and they had never even thought about it. That's amazing. I, you, that's exactly where, but a dog with a trauma, which mm-hmm. socks had, I'm sure plenty. Um, that is a really good option. I'd never thought of it that way. So I'm discovering this as you're speaking as the vice president of Nova pets alive, what frustrates you most about pet parents approach to the adoption process? Well, I think people don't understand how rescues work. I um, think they don't understand that they're widely operated by volunteers and Nova Pets Alive prides itself. Like we are pretty small. We keep things really small to kind of like we did with the WAG pack um, to provide, yes, to provide quality, <laughs> right? Like we want the pet parents experience or the adopters experience to be good. We, we don't want them walking away from rescue frustrated like many do, right? Because they're like, I never hear back, um, blah, 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 you know, all that stuff. So we keep it small. We turn off applications as soon as they have like three good apps. So we don't have like a backlog. You know, we have auto responses that go out. We tell everybody when dogs are adopted or cats are adopted. So they don't wait. Um, we get back to them soon time. So, and we're very clear in our process. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. Um, so I think people don't understand that we're volunteers and they want like immediate responses. They want a lot of backstory that we just can't give them because you know, a lot of these dogs were found as strays or the owners surrendered them to shelters. And not a lot of people want to chat when they're surrendering a dog. They just want to get out of there. So we don't get a lot of the background, you know? Right. So they want to know all this background and they want to really like, just have this really, really intense experience where like they're very handheld. And I don't think there's a lot of recognition of like, people are doing this for free. They're working really hard. They're doing the best they can. Like benefit of the doubt, which we kind of always used to talk about. Like benefit of the doubt. Like Give us the benefit of the doubt. We're in this industry because we love the animals. Don't make us out to be bad guys because we have some limitations and some of the expectations are not sustainable. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Also, I would say that wanting to know that the dog is good with kids, cats, other dogs, and, you know, um, they want them to be cat tested, but like, what does that mean? Like, am I just going to throw my cat into a room with an unknown dog and just like, hope it works itself out? You know, that's dangerous. So, you know, we can't guarantee that all these dogs are going to be good. And even if they were, even if I introduced them to Simon and it went fine, that doesn't mean that, you know, down the road, right? So we can't guarantee these things. And people, I mean, across the board, I'm sure with breeders too, that's why they go to breeders because they think if they get a certain breed, it's going to guarantee certain behaviors, but that's not real. (laughs) We have seen that time and time again. And I've had guests talk about that time and time again, where even breeds that are supposed to be a certain way don't always end up being that way. And Simon's your cat, who is the most amazing cat that's probably ever walked this planet, who's friendly with strangers and dogs and other cats and kids and all the, the, everybody. And he's just like the best cat. So yeah, you train, like, I'm sure Titan would love Simon, but Titan, when we had the kittens, yeah, when we had the kittens at home, Titan was terrified of them. And my Titan is a dog who yeah. is terrified of cats. If that tells you anything about Titan. <laughs> what is one piece of advice that you would give a family who has young children and is looking to adopt a pet cat dog? Right. That's a really good question. Um, and it's something I wish 
people would be more realistic about. So um, I would, I hate to say this because I want people to adopt older dogs. No I love judgment from me. I know exactly what you're going to say. A puppy, a puppy. A puppy. And that's why when I just adopted my Bernie Spotten dog died a year ago and he was the best. And we have had this like gaping hole of this really kid friendly dog because Harley was my other two are too unpredictable for a kid. So they can like feed treats through the gate. And like we have positive controlled experiences, but that's not like a little girl and her dog, you know? And when it came down to getting another dog, there was no other choice for me, but to get a puppy so that I could try my best to properly socialize him with children and be more confident in his behaviors because I had more control of his upbringing. We got an eight week old puppy who, you know, had been, had been born in a home um, that I knew them because they came through my rescue. I pulled him out of the crate and intake and I went, oh my God, this is my dog. So we talk about first <laughs> love at first sight, but um, I, he was born in a home because the owners adopted a dog from the local shelter who was pregnant and they found that out later because a lot of other shelters don't spay neuter they don't do anything so they found that she was pregnant they kept her let her have her babies and when they were ready to be adopted we took them um and we took her actually because she ended up being too high energy for them they were like an older couple and she was a border collie and like crazy really good but like just too much for them too much for that that family right yeah so they all came up um and so pretty controlled upbringing but he did resource guard against Evie, my toddler. He did bite her. It wasn't a big deal. It was my fault because I wasn't watching because I let myself get too comfortable with the puppy. Um, but yeah, so that happened. And there are downsides too, because puppies do have mouthiness. Like I, she looked like she was an abuse victim for weeks and weeks and weeks because he would bite her. Um, so those are the downsides. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's kind of more of a safe thing because you're taking an adult where you don't know the background and it's not even, they don't have to be abused by children. They just have never been exposed to kids. That's it. That's all it takes. People always assume that they've been abused and they don't have to be. It's just, they don't know kids. So, you know, um, but I also have adopted out, you know, I've had dogs that I fostered adult dogs that I've actually introduced to Evie and were amazing with her. So that's my other point. I would do a puppy or I would go to a rescue where they use fosters and I would ask for somebody that has in a foster home with children and then how they've done with kids. And that's the only time that we really ever feel comfortable adopting out dogs to homes with small kids um, that we've seen them with other dogs or other kids to right. know that, you know, or they don't have any resource guarding, you know, behaviors, but we really don't feel comfortable adopting out dogs to small kid homes without having any kind of experience with it. Cause it's just, it's risky. It is. It's super risky. Kids and dogs have been so, I always knew professionally, I always knew that that was going to be a challenge, but Mm -hmm. as the parent watching it happen or unfold in front of me, where when socks bit Noah right in the face and he, she didn't hurt him. She didn't mean, she didn't want to hurt him. She just wanted space. He wasn't even really in her space. Yeah. Like I watched it all happen. She was resource guarding me. And his being near me was the problem. Mm -hmm. And so immediately that brought me back to reality where dogs and babies or kids, he was not quite two years old at the time. It was Mother's Day, 2018. And it was like, I still remember it was terrible. 2019, I can't remember. 2019. And it was so, it was, I was managing it. I told Chris, get Noah because it's getting heated. And before he could make his way over, she had already snapped. It is so, so much of a risk because you don't, even if you are paying attention, even if you know that there's a problem, it can still happen before you are able to separate them. So yeah. What would you consider an age for a child where they are no longer at, at risk for that kind of unexpected or or kind of risky interaction? I say I use, I co, I co do the dog foster stuff, which then kind of, um, rolls into dog adoption stuff. Cause we know the dog's best. So we do the foster side and then we make them available for adoption. We review all the applications and we'll send, you know, I use Hillary who I work with as my gauge for that because she gets so nervous with any kind of kids because she doesn't have experience with kids. So, you know, she's more relaxed when the kid is about 10 years old. Um, And I think that's pretty fair, right? Like they're, they're taller. They're not like directly in the dog's face. So when they're just looking at the dog, they're not just like their height. Um, They have more understanding about, you know, 
cause and effect um, and can follow directions. Um, I say that, but my toddler's amazing at understanding when dogs need space. Like actually because I had a- she cup- needs space sometimes. So she yeah. gets it. And also, she, I mean, Poncho does not like her, my dog. And we've had to teach her kind of like, you know, we can't do that because of X. Um, but we have this puppy here today, we're doing intake and, and Leo was running around with the puppy and Evie goes, Leo, give her space. Like, you know, does like, she needs space. Like she gets it. So like, I'm really fortunate with her. I think she's just been so exposed and we are like, no, we don't go up to dogs. We don't know, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I think, I think 10 would be good because I think they can have a little bit more impulse control when it comes to dogs. They're not just going to like go run at them. Um, and that's kind of where we, I have a couple of dogs right now that would do great in home with kids. They just need to be a little bit older and they're not going to get knocked over as easily when dogs are excited. Like yeah. they're a little bit more solid. They got more of a core. So. Right, right, right. And honestly, like the energy is different. Like as yeah. somebody who is sensitive to people's energies, I'm sensitive to Noah's energy. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like I'm like, oh, but yeah, you he can't gets... blame a dog. <laughs> no, I'm like, oh my God, no, I calm down because he's three and not even three and a half yet. And even Mila, who's 11 months, her energy's lower than the three and a half year old. So she's having to be like, whoa, am I, should I yeah. be scared? Like he's getting excited, but he's just like singing old McDonald, having a great time. Right. So for a dog who doesn't get that, like, Titan now is much more amenable to having the do- the kids around because he doesn't want to be separated. He doesn't like that. He doesn't like to be put in the dog room, which is like a super nice room. Uh, the other two are happy to be in there. Uh, Radar is getting old and he just kind of wants his space, even from us, unless we're petting him, like watching a show, he just doesn't want to be like hanging around the mess. Um, but Titan now is more amenable because he kind of has gotten used to it. But a right. do- if I had brought Titan in, with a three-year-old, that would he would have had to go back. Titan yeah. would have been like, absolutely not. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. I, I say this to everybody, you know, toddlers especially. Toddlers are hard for dogs. Even the best dogs, even the most social open dogs, toddlers are hard. Um, you know, that's like the worst age. Poncho did not start caring about Evie in like a negative way until she started crawling. And that's when he, otherwise we used to lay in bed together. He was great with her. He'd lick her face. Like, cause she was very, like, she just laid there and she just like, didn't do anything. And the second she started crawling and acting weird, like, you know, he started getting worried about her and he would even put himself like behind gates and stuff to get away from her, which was really nice communication. So that's awesome. It's hard. You know, you know, you've trained your dog well when they remove themselves from a situation it's that's uncomfortable. It's beautiful. It's beautiful <laughs> to me. I like one, I will tell you a, a quick little story that just happened during an intake. I put a dog behind a baby gate I have in my house. It's like very tall. And Evie was sitting there watching her iPad and she said, can I pet the puppy? And I said, wait till I'm back inside. She said, okay. And I went outside to go th- say thank you to the transport driver. And um, he kind of was talking to me a little bit and I, and I heard like a bam. And I went, "Uh Oh, that's not good. I said, I got to go. And I go back in the house and I see that dog running around the house. It's like a six month old dog, like very friendly. It wasn't something that I was really that worried about. So I wasn't like, but I, I, I see her running around the house. She had climbed up the baby gate and jumped out. And I'm like, Evie, where are you? I'm like, bad mom move. What a dumb trainer move. I just did. But Evie had gone to a door that goes to our dining room. She'd gotten off the table, gone to the door, grabbed the door and shut herself like where she was in the corner and the door was blocking her in so she could see through the glass but she was basically in a cage like she caged. and I said what are you doing and she goes I don't know that dog and I was like low clap Evie (laughs) (laughs) and he and then she goes can I pet and I said yes you can And I tell everyone that story. Cause I'm like, how did it, like, that was amazing. She said, she saw that dog climb out and said, I don't know that dog. I'm going to go remove myself and like caged herself in. And she wasn't scared. She was like, can I go pat him now? I'm like, yeah, sure. Like, let's go. So that's same thing. amazing. Dogs- and I think, I actually think that that's a really good like training thing for children. Like you don't know that dog. Remove do you yourself. know that dog? I don't know that dog. When you don't know that dog, you do this. When you do know that dog, you do that. Like, that's such a good simple but like i've never heard it used that way so i'm gonna start using you don't know that dog yeah evie (laughs) credit to evie i'm gonna start using that noah you don't know that dog what do you do when you don't know that dog i love it yeah he got she got it so yeah maybe it's maybe it's very palatable to children i don't know yeah (laughs) 
no it's palatable to me it makes sense you don't know that dog i mean i could even say that to my husband like don't pet that dog you don't know that dog right don't pet that dog in my yard you don't know that dog because he's done it he's done it before where he just like brings the dog home because he found it on the street i'm like you don't know that dog you don't know if it has worms we have three dogs and two children who play outside why would you bring that dog right 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 <laughs> exactly so keep the dog out front on a leash and then tell me about yeah, it separate. don't bring it into my yard please i beg you so right. i have to wrap this up otherwise we could talk all day obviously yeah. you are personal friends and this is going to go blah 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 all day long so right. tell our listeners and viewers on youtube how could anybody in northern virginia get in touch with you get in touch with nova pets alive um so i my website is uh, dogmindedtraining.com um and my contact information is on there nova pets alive is novapetsalive.org we're very active on social media all of our active like a adoptable animals are on there. Um, so following that is probably the best way to like stay in the know. Um, and Hillary responds to all emails and Hillary is a administrative goddess and responds to everything <laughs> incredibly quick. So we're a very responsive team. Thanks to her. <laughs> if anybody outside of Northern Virginia finds a dog on Nova pets alive, like what's your transport? Like, is that something that's possible or is it a little unsustainable right now? So we go about two hours out from our location. Um, so that way, if there's a return, we it's not crazy to try to get the dog back or the cat back. We do have cats too. I just haven't really mentioned that. Um, we do a <laughs> lot of cats. Um, so it's really just about two hours away. So if you live about two hours away from Northern Virginia, um, you know, that's, that's, you know, kind of the limit that we will go. Um, but if you don't like, and you have friends in Northern Virginia, like sharing it really helps or commenting or liking on posts because then it gets more views um, that Absolutely. you can help that way too. Awesome. Well, thank you, Beth. I want to propose a toast to you for being my friend and for being on the show today. And I'd like to propose a toast to our uh, executive producer, Mark Winter, for making this show possible for our listeners and our viewers uh, on YouTube. Please uh, subscribe, like, all the things. But thank you for being on uh, with us today. Uh, here's to a life covered in pet hair because there's no better way to live. Ching, ching. Ching, ching. <laughs> Cheers. I'm running out of drinks. I'm going to have to need a refill for the after show. <laughs> Uh, so if you want to learn more about Covered in Pet Hair, please visit CoveredInPetHair.com or PetLifeRadio.com. We'll see you next time.